All right, so I'd like to introduce Tom Burns now. Um, Tom Burns is doing our talk for this month. Uh, Tom Burns uh, is a professor in the Department of English. He's teaching writing courses there at Ohio Wesleyan University. And he used to be the director of Perkins back when I first started going, um, but he's retired from Perkins now, but still very active with the John Glenn Astronomy Park. And Tom, how long have you been a cast member for? Um, uh, I think since 1986 or something like that. Let's see, a long time. That was the year I was born. So you're you're this this old in cast membership. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Tom is going to talk to us about Elvis on Mars: A Journey Through a Real Weird and Wonderful Perceptions of the Reddish Planet. So. Everybody All right, sharing my screen now. See if this is going to work for me. And come on, oh. let's see. Ta -da. There we go. Elvis on Mars. First, a few warnings here. There are some elements of this talk that are truly reprehensible a few that are disgusting. And so prepare yourselves, my friends. And if any uh, uh, people are watching with their children, I will try to give you some warning about the, the, those when they come up. And there are some, what I like to call, ooh, -ee -oo moments. And I will say, ooh, -ee -oo, and I'll try to put emphasis on the ooh, so everybody can say, Ooh, -ee -oo, together, okay? If that's possible, that would really help me to know that you're really getting into this talk. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, on this first screen, I, I, I just wanted to give some sense of the kind of weirdness that is has been associated with Mars. On the left, you see an advertisement for Kirk's American Soap. This was uh, advertisement appeared about the time that Percival Lowell was seeing canals on Mars. And it goes to show kind of the assumption that Mars was a livable place, and in fact, that there were, was some kind of alien living there. The second one is, uh, it's a sandworm erupting from the surface of the planet. No, actually, it's just a bit of outgassing, uh, a little gif uh, taken from some uh, images from one of the Mars landers, uh, but there is a class of people who, when these Mars images are released, and sometimes there are thousands of them released at one time, who will go over every single image with a magnifying glass searching for signs of Martian life. So on that basis, we begin our journey First, by talking about some of the physical characteristics of Mars, because they're going to come up later. Uh, Mars about half the diameter of Earth, Earth 8,000 miles wide, Mars 2,000 miles wide. Um, it has about one third, a little bit less than the gravity of Earth. It takes about 667 uh, Earth days to travel once around the sun has a long year, in other words, uh, and it has the same tilt as Earth. However, because Mars is so far away from the sun compared to Earth, Mars is the fourth planet, Earth is the second, um, its tilt does not actually, it isn't the major factor in it, the change of its seasons. Distance actually plays a part in the Martian seasons. Um, one thing that's going to be very important later on when we talk about your typical Martian as portrayed in the media um, is that it is its atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide and it's very, very thin. A very, very 
low atmospheric density. If you saw the movie Total Recall, you know, if you experience the Martian atmospheric pressure, your eyes would pop right out of your head. Now, we go back to Mars and uh, way, way back to the time of the ancient Greeks and Romans, and we understand, I hope, that the word planet comes from the Greek word planeta, which means wanderer. Uh, to the Greeks and then to the Romans to some degree, uh, the fact that the planets could wander against the starry background meant that they were gods. And the god Ares, or Mars to the Romans, um, signified maleness and strength. The symbol for Mars is still, as you see at the top of the screen, uh, the symbol for maleness. But to the Romans, he was most specifically the god of war. However, he was also kind of a trickster. He was good at tricking people into yielding to their emotions and engaging in acts of war that they might not normally do. And is that element of a trickster we're going to see later on in our portrayal of the of what we might call the uh, typical Martian or one variety of the typical Martian anyway. Okay, so what we end up with, if we look at the kind of earliest sort of scientific view of the sky is that Earth, of course, is at the center. The wanderers orbit around it, either orbit around it loosely or are embedded in crystalline spheres that kind of rub against each other, producing the music of the spheres. Perhaps you've heard of that. Um, but if they're farther away, of course, they orbit at greater distances, and that means they move more slowly. The so called a geocentric model of the universe, which puts Earth at the center, then Luna, the moon, um, then Mercury, then Venus, then the sun, etc. Now, this was all codified in the fourth century BEC, BCE by a fellow named Aristoteles, his the Roman pronunciation of his name is Aristotle, who borrowed uh, the system from a philosopher named Eudoxus. And in contradiction to the minority view as uh, suggested by Aristarchus of Samos, he really got it right. He put the sun at the center, but Aristotle systematized this and made a serious error that plagued both philosophy and science for two millennia. That's 2000 years, folks. It's important to understand that one of the weirdest aspects of Mars is that we had it wrong for most of civilized history. And that mistake was that the orbits of these planets were uniform. They never changed their velocity, their speed. They were absolutely circular, perfect, perfectly circular. And uh, that that motion never changed. Uniform circular motion becomes a difficulty that plagues science for 2000 years. So here is the way that ends up turning out. You've got the moon, um, Mercury, um, Venus, the sun, then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and that was it, of course, for the naked eye planets, and then the fixed sphere, sphere of stars, and then what was called the sphere of the prime mover, the creator of the universe. Okay, so all of this stayed pretty steady as astronomers began to be able to actually plot the motions of these planets. 
as, uh, Mars was a particular problem, as we shall see. Um, Ptolemy had some splaining to do, and, and he had to change this system to do that explaining because, first of all, it did not predict the positions of the planets ac uh, accurately. And on, Venus was not particularly considered a problem because they couldn't get a correct position of it anyway, because they couldn't see it, as you well know, Venus is generally most visible in kind of that kind of evening twilight where it's hard to find without a telescope, a star to compare its position with. As a matter of fact, the Greeks originally considered it two planets, one in the morning and one in the evening. Um, but Mars was the problem because Mars engages in what is called retrograde motion. That is, it seems to move across the sky and then stop and then kind of loop backwards and then move back in its original direction. And the Earth-centered model with its spheres and orbits around that Earth-centered model with its spheres and its orbits around the Earth did not work. So Ptolemy came up with this weird model, epicycles. That is, for every of the so-called planets, and by the way, the moon was considered a planet, a wanderer, um, and the sun to explain that retrograde motion, Ptolemy added another perfect circle, this time in orbit around a point where Mars was in that original orbit. And you end up with a really kind of beautiful system. It explains retrograde motion. It doesn't do a good job, however, of explaining the position of the planets, especially Mars in the sky. Um, thus, astronomers, especially in the Arab world, began to add more circles, epicycles on top of epicycles. And every time they did, the position of the planets, especially Mars, became more accurate. So this system sort of worked, and it works especially if the number of epicycles increases from three to four to five to 10 to a thousand. And if you plug infinity, an infinite number of epicycles into the into the equation, then it actually does predict with high accuracy the position of the planets, which means, of course, that it also doesn't work. Um, along came Tycho Brahe, who was the uh, most incredible of astronomers. In the late 1500s, he began to do very accurate measurements of the positions of the planets and to explain the problems in the that Ptolemaic model, the model of epicycles, he then uh, put, still put Tellus, Earth, at the center and put the moon orbiting around it, and then the sun orbiting Earth, and then Mercury and, I'm sorry, Mercury and, and Venus in orbit around the sun. The trouble was, he, among other things, that he kept Mars in orbit around the Earth, which all of a sudden um, creates the same problem with retrograde motion. And this actually does, this model actually does improve the measurements for the uh, position of Mercury and, and Venus, but it does not 
produce accurate positions for the other planets, and it does a very poor job of explaining retrograde motion. So, along comes the Copernican revolution, which puts the sun at the center. However, it still doesn't do a good job of predicting the position of uh, the positions of the planets because Copernicus made the same error that had plagued all of the attempts of, at creating these models from the beginning, and that was Aristotle's uniform circular motion. And Galileo, um, despite the fact that uh, a lot of people give him credit for uh, proving the Copernican model, or at least um, invalidating the Aristotelian model, did a lot of observations of the phases of Venus, for example. And while that proves, uh, that can be explained using Brahe's model, by the way. And uh, he uh, saw the moons of Jupiter, which, quote, broke the spheres, unquote. Unfortunately, people weren't doing spheres anymore. So uh, the planets were by this time in free orbit. So Galileo didn't help much, even though he tried. And then along came the person who is to become Tycho Brahe's mathematical slave, Johannes Kepler. Now, Kepler is the only way to describe him <laughs> as a mystical oddball. Uh, there are a lot of elements to this, but um, in his uh, little commentary, uh, which was written sometime before uh, 1514, he outlines not just a defense of the uh, Copernican model with the sun at the center, but also his kind of mystical beliefs, which were that somehow the creator of the universe, God, had embodied his perfection into the structure of the universe. So that is, if the sun is at the center, the sun represents God the Father. The sphere of the stars, which is way out at the edge, uh, represents the Son of God, Jesus, and the space in between represents the Holy Spirit. Uh, to put this another way, he was a kind of mystic in the vein of the, math the Greek mathematician Pythagoras, who I know in the eighth grade you had to learn that theorem and all that, but Pythagoras really was a mystic. He believed that geometry represented a kind of the kind of looking into the mind of God. And that's exactly the way Kepler felt. So there was a moment. Kepler, after studying philosophy and mathematics and astronomy, et cetera, at the University of Tübingen, um, was standing in front of his gymnasium, that's our, we would call it a high school class, and he drew a triangle on the board. And he drew a circle inside the triangle. And he drew a circle outside the triangle so that the two circles were touching the triangles. And he at once had what can only be called a mystical experience because this to him represented the perfection of the cosmos. As the triangle was divided, each, each of the sides of this equilateral triangle were divided in half by the inner circle. And the outer circle was divided into thirds by the triangle and the inner circle was divided into thirds by the triangle. Uh, 
and the figures themselves were perfect in their symmetry. And he realized that that a thought at that moment, there were six planets and five perfect symmetrical three dimensional solids, polyhedra, and for years, he tried to estimate, he knew uh, along uh, more than a century before Titius, uh, the Titius Bode law, which kind of systematized this, he knew that e if the sun were at the center, that each planet starting with Mercury and going to Venus would be twice the distance as you moved out. And so he worked with these geometric solids to try to recreate that um, kind of double the distance. And he started with Saturn way out there. And in it, he put a cube and uh, or the, no, first he put a sphere representing the orbit of Saturn. And then he put a cube inside of it. And then he put a sphere inside of that. And that was the orbit of Jupiter. And he went down through the various of these geometric shapes until he got to, I had to learn how to pronounce isosceles to the isosahedron, which is a set of isosceles triangles with 18 sides to form the solid for the orbit of Mercury. And there it was, the geometric perfect perfection that represented the mind of God. What was God most of all? On his largest and most perfect level, he was a geometer, a practicer of geometry. Wow. Well, of course, this explains the twice the distance, but it certainly doesn't explain the movements of the planets. And uh, sometime later, um, as he explains in his great work, Mysterium Cosmographicum, he sees uh, the truth of the matter and it really doesn't have anything to do with these geometric solids. It is that the orbits of the planets are not perfect circles. They are in ellipses with, imagine grabbing a circle and stretching it out, if those of you who don't know what an ellipse is, uh, which would give you two uh, foci or centers. And he put the sun at one of those foci and, this perfectly explained the positions of the planets. It meant that by some mysterious force, which Galileo was later to, and Newton was later to explain as gravity, the planets moved faster when they got closer to the sun and began to move more slowly as they moved away. And with that, you could actually mathematically predict the position of these planets. In other words, a 2000 year old problem solved, Kepler had nailed it. Unfortunately, he was never able to give up that geometric model with the duodecahedrons and things like that. And he spent the rest of his life in a frustrating attempt to try to bring these two models together and he never succeeded, bless his heart. And we'll skip all that. Okay, then we come, I mean, you know, people continue to, try to accurately model the, uh, the uh, to accurately uh, measure the positions of the planets. But remember with Galileo, along came the telescope and uh, astronomers were able to see some rather difficult to discern details. 
There were polar caps on Mars. It really was red with green markings on it. They could see dust storms and things like that. By the way, the green markings aren't really green as we shall see. And the, the great moment of change and per perhaps the Urgrund of all of the weirdness about Mars that is to follow happened around 1895 when a fellow named Percival Lowell, perhaps you've heard of him, uh, began using his big old telescope. He was, a, a, you'd call him an amateur astronomer, but he had studied astronomy and mathematics in uh, college. And he built himself a telescope of enormous size, a refracting telescope, out on, uh, out on the outskirts of town in a little burg in those days called Flagstaff, Arizona. I've actually had a chance to observe with this telescope. And he began, I mean, he stared at Mars during the Martian opposition, that close approach to Mars of 1895, night after night for as long as he could. And he began to see things. Besides the green markings, he began to see these series of uh, canale, uh, or canals, channels that seem to connect the polar caps to the green markings. And this, of course, based on some other things that astronomers and that Percival Lowell saw um, to create some weird speculations. There were dust storms and that indicates a very thin atmosphere. And here I think is one of the notable things that people notice that the polar caps shrink during the Martian summer and they get big during, get bigger during the Martian winter. And what the canal suggests is that there is an in, a group of, in, there is a civilization there, intelligent life that has undertaken a massive, impressive effort to create these giant canals running for thousands of miles to carry water from the, the carry water from the water rich poles. And remember those green markings do tend to get larger in summer and they must be vegetation. And what you get is not just life on the planet, but you get life of extraordinary intelligence and life that was very energetic as well to create this, this in, enormous system of canals. Now, what we, the reality of, is of course that the atmosphere is exceedingly thin, mostly made up of carbon dioxide, there are clouds and those clouds are important because they indicate that the wind is kicking up and creating these um, dust storms. The green markings do change shape, but it's mostly because of the dust storms. So that during the summer when the atmosphere begins to heat up, you get these uh, very windy conditions and they blow the red dusty earth off of rocky formations. And that makes these green markings, which are by the way, not green. The green is an optical illusion by contrast with the red soil, which is, you know, has an element of rust in it to make it reddish, ferric oxide. And of course, during the summer, the polar caps do shrink. Unfortunately, and they do have water in them, but um, the atmospheric pressure is so low that even water will not turn to a liquid 
it be and, and cer this is certainly true of the carbon dioxide. It goes straight from a solid to a gas. It sublimates, so there is no liquid water actually to carry along these canals. So he was wrong. Just what he was seeing, as far as the canals are concerned, I read a dozen articles on this, everything ranging from staring at something too long to that he was staring so hard that he was actually seeing the, the structure of tiny structure of capillaries on his own retina. Nobody knows for sure what uh, Lowell was seeing, but I have to tell you folks, it created a kind of furor in the public imagination that continues to this very day. Um, and I'm only mentioning Edgar Rice Burroughs. It wasn't, certainly wasn't the first novel about Mars, but what is interesting about it, of course, is they got a bunch of people like people inhabiting Mars. And it really isn't, scientific or science fiction at all. I mean, you could set uh, the John Carter on Mars series in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and you could have the same thing. But uh, Burroughs was attracted to this kind of uh, uh, imaginative view that people had of Mars. The real game changer about uh, Mars in fiction was uh, a science fiction novel by H.G. Wells called War of the Worlds. How many of you have seen War of the World or have read the novel War of the Worlds? Yeah, lots of you, I hope. Raise your hand, raise your hand. Um, this was published, serialized in uh, um, Pearson's Illustrated Magazine or something like that, starting in 1897. Realize that that's just two years after Lowell made his initial Martian observations and the Martians are nasty. They um, appear in these a tripod, they, they blend in uh, what we would now call flying saucers. They appear in these tripod objects which spew out poisonous gas. And they are also, you know, they're tough to fight because all we have uh, is in the case of, of the original novel, uh, pre-Civil War technology, basically cannons to try to stop these massive weapons of war. Here's my first uh, contact with H.G. Uh, Wells. It was the Classics Illustrated version, which was updated. It looks to me like it all happened in uh, England in World War I. Uh, but I'd like to, just to give you a sense of these aliens, um, I'd just like to kind of summarize H.G. Wells' description of them. They were, they looked like octopi, octopuses. And uh, of course, there was a definite fascination with the octopus around this time. Uh, read another science fiction novel, H.G. Wells' Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, and you'll see a giant octopus there. Uh, they had a disembodied head to, um, with two uh, V-shaped eyes, a V-shaped beak-like mouth, two uh, branches each of eight whip-like tentacles. The tentacles will appear many times later on. They are grouped around the mouth and they reproduce asexually by budding from a parent. Internally, they consist of a brain, lungs, heart, and blood vessels, but critically, they have no organs of digestion. They live by 
sucking the blood out of other living things through these little pipettes that come out of their tentacles. And so why are they invading planet Earth, my friends? It is to suck human blood. The novel was widely popular and it begat what is one of the great weird moments in the history of Martian weirdness. And that is Orson Welles broadcast of The War of the Worlds on the night before Halloween, their Halloween broadcast in 1938. Um, This was, of course, a pretty fair reenactment of the H.G. Wells novel. And it was very carefully scripted. The first half was, in fact, a kind of a live broadcast, or it pretended to be a live broadcast. First, did well, let me read um, a description of it that I got from, of all places, a book called Over the Fence is Out, which is a reminiscence of a, uh, a young boy, later grown into a man when he wrote the novel, of these. And um, it contains a pretty fair description, not only of uh, the way the broadcast was structured, at the beginning of it at least, um, uh, but also of its effect. Um, I was sprawled on the rug reading Buck Rogers and Hairbreath Harry when the radio played in the background. Both father and I perked up at the introduction of one our, of our favorite programs, Mercury Theater on the Air, followed by the announcement that some, tonight's production would be War of the Worlds. Father and I put down our papers to listen. The program began with a weather report. Then there was some dance music. And suddenly the announcer broke in with a news bulletin announcing that creatures from outer space were landing in New Jersey and spreading across the countryside, spraying heat rays. It sounded so real. If father and I had known it was Orson Welles, we'd have sworn this was the end. So get the idea here? Everybody who heard this from the beginning knew it was a fictional broadcast. However, not many people were listening from the beginning. On another radio channel was the Edgar, Edgar Bergen hour. You know Edgar Bergen, he it was a ventriloquist, Charlie McCarthy, and all of that. And everybody watched that. And so when, but when a commercial announcement came on, you've done this yourself, I know you have, they switched channels and they got Mercury Theater all the, on the air. And all of a sudden, the radio, this reporter, this announcer in the midst of this was choking on poison gas and watching people die around him. And there was among a certain percentage of the population, nobody knows how much. Panic. Now, how much panic there actually was is the subject of some controversy. Um, but to give you a sense of it, the experience of some people I'm going to continue to read from Over the Fences Out. Um, okay, where were we? Okay. Just then, Uncle Harry came down the stairs. Father waggled a finger at him and said, Shh, Harry, a news bulletin. Over the loudspeaker came an authoritative voice, quote, on the scene of the landing, reporting that a Martian cylinder had landed. What? said Harry. Shh, said father. The announcement went on. Good heavens, something's wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one and another. I can see the whole thing's body. It's large as a bear and it glistens like wet leather. But the face, 
What the hell's going on here, demanded Uncle Harry. Answered father, in a voice totally disinterested and nonchalant, we're being attacked by Martians. But I wouldn't worry about it, Harry. They must be a good 20 miles away. My God, said Harry. The announcement, announcer went on. It's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. The eyes are black and gleam like a serpent. The mouth is V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips that seem to quiver and pulsate. And then an announcement from the Secretary of Interior who intoned, citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country. At this point, Uncle Harry lit out the door like a madman. And at this point, son and father go out on the front porch to see what's happening outside. And this is what they saw. The worst reaction in our neighborhood was by old Mr. Kearney, who ran into the Elkins house down the street and laid out Mrs. Elkins with the butt end of an ax. The two had been feuding for years and Mrs. Kearney wanted to get in the last blow before the, the arrival of the Martians. The writer goes on to say that Mrs. Kearney survived, but with a silver plate in her head. Another incident. An elderly gentleman from the end of the block took off like a sprinter, white mane flying straight out behind him shouting, our time has come, our time has come. He in fact had been predicting the end of the world every day for years and he, now he was more or less happy that his prediction had come true and he could put his master plan into effect. He was found by police hours later, beating his way through the woods on hand and knees he explained that he was searching for two of every kind of animal and that his mission was terribly important and they shouldn't bother him, but they bothered him anyway. Now the third one is slightly salacious, prepare yourselves, hold your hands over children's ears. Father and I witnessed the third incident in our neighborhood with our own eyes. And it was a rare thrill for me as it represented my first opportunity for an overall look at the undressed female body. She was a chubby woman new to our street and she came barreling down the sidewalk wearing only a cloche hat. Various parts of her were flying in all direction as she passed father and me. She slowed slightly, waved and said, attentive but not unfriendly, hi. Then she roared down the street and out of sight. I never did find out her name. She moved a few days later. Now, the result of this, even if the pandemonium was not as great as seem as the these kind of over -sensation, sensationalized headlines need to suggest is was pandemonium at the radio broadcast station. As uh, uh, described by John Hausman, who was the producer, and yes, we're talking the John Hausman, who later became the famous actor. Uh, when they were finally off the air for the break, the studio doors burst open. The following hours were a nightmare. The building, as Hausman suggested it, the building was suddenly full of people and dark blue uniforms. Hustled out of the studio, we were locked into a small back office on another floor. Here we sat incommunicado while network employees were busily collecting, destroying, or locking up all the scripts and records of the broadcast. Finally, the press were let loose upon us Ravening for horror, how many deaths had we heard of, implying that we had knew, heard of thousands? What did we know of the fatal stampede in a Jersey hall, implying that it was one of many? What traffic deaths? The ditches must be choked with corp corpses. The suicide, haven't you heard about the one on Riverside Drive? It is quite all vague in my memory, but quite terrible. 
As a matter of fact, poor Orson Welles, the rising star, was seen dejected after the broadcast. He was just trying to do a good Halloween story, sitting in a chair, glumly shaking his head with his head down and saying, this will ruin me. Well, pst, it didn't ruin him. The next year, he produced Citizen Kane. The greatest, some people say the greatest movie ever made, but that ruined him because it died at the box office. Now, uh, we begin to see a change happening around in, in the early 1950s. Uh, we begin to see um, science fiction novels that were not the old style of science fiction, which is kind of the, you know, ray guns in space kind of science fiction as exemplified by the first Sunsman series by E.E. E. Doc Smith, the kind of thing that I used to like to read. But I soon discovered um, long afterwards that uh, Ray Bradbury in 1951 changed the world by publishing two science fiction novels. One of them was Fahrenheit 451, about book burning in the future. And the other one was The Martian Chronicles. And these two novels began to see science fiction, but in specific, in the case of Martian Chronicles, uh, the Martian civilization as emblematic of some deeper and not so pleasant characteristics in a human society. Uh, one of the Martian Chronicles deals with racism, for instance. Another one deals with um, the treatment of, of the indigenous Martians by the uh, earthling invaders who come because of a nuclear apocalypse on earth and they're looking for a place to say, by the way, note the canals. But if there is a year that kind of changed the world as far as the representation and kind of established the representation of the Martian in the popular imagination. It was 1953. And uh, the, there are two, two movies in particular uh, that did that. And one was, of course, I hope you've all seen it, War of the Worlds, which was um, a take on the original novel with the ray guns and all of a sudden the tripods are now able to float in midair. Now the thing to recognize about the, these is that the original novel was set in uh, England near London and War of the Worlds, uh, the uh, broadcast was set in New Jersey uh, about just not too far, something like 20 miles or something away from New York City. Um, Invaders from Mars, which was a big box office hit and one of my personal favorites, and I saw it 10 years later on a black and white TV, I was shocked to find out that it was actually originally in the theaters in color. Um, also from 1953, where we begin to see the evil alien uh, kind of at his, at his worst. Notice that the alien here is green. Green will come up later. Notice also that the alien is carrying a woman. This it becomes very, this is going to sound awfully sexist to you, and you want to know why? Because it is, as we shall see. Um, but it has some of the characteristics that we would expect out of the typical Martian. And, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But it is particularly horrifying because uh, this boy, Billy, uh, sees these, it's set in a small town, uh, sees the, 
this these al this flying saucer land just over the hill across a field and it, he tries to tell his parents and they don't believe him but his father agrees to go out and look his father comes back a zombie and he has a little knobby thing on the back of his neck and um the same thing happens to his mother and the same thing happens to most of the people in the city until finally one person the town school, one of the town school teachers actually believes him and they have to go in there and try to destroy this, uh, this flying saucer before it takes over all of the, uh, before it takes over the whole world or at least the town or something like that. Now what's particularly scary when they go in, of course, is that poor Billy, it almost gets this knobby thing put into the back of the, his, neck to control his brain and uh this is really just i i can i i have to be honest with you folks i still have nightmares about this movie to this very day 60 years later um, what's interesting about the movie, though, is that the kind of the head alien, you will note, has certain characteristics that we will see in the typical alien. The big brain, the tentacles, etc. And in that regard, his underlings, <laughs> what, what awful uh, special effects we have here and makeup. This these characteristics are kind of derivative of the kind of alien imagined by people who took Lowell seriously. First of all, they got the big eyes. Why do they have the big eyes? Because Mars is farther away from the sun and only gets like 44% uh, of the kind of uh, the solar rays that Earth gets. They must have big brains because they, uh, they created this incredible uh, kind of set of canals. They must have big eyes to collect the light, but those eyes have to, eyes have, to have some sort of protection against the incredible ultraviolet rays uh, that, and solar storms that Mars is going to get. And they have to have a, a kind of reflective surface to kind of bounce the, the bad stuff off. And by the way, they're often green. We'll talk about that later, but anyway. And they're also very skinny and tall, at least taller than they are wide proportionally compared to a human being. Why is that? because Mars has only what, about one third the gravity or something like that, I can't remember. And uh, so they they could easily grow tall. They also don't have very strong, a big muscular system because they don't need it. Recognize him, there he is, phoning home. And, and that basic alien uh, occurs all through the history of all this to this present day, at least in, to the movie. E.T. Now, we begin to see, starting, oh, what did I, I wrote down the dates of this. Starting in 1979, we begin to see another outlet of this kind of Martian weirdness that, oh, my dear friends. I mean, my mother, you know, we, go to visit my mother and she said, I say, do you need to go to the grocery? Well, I'll be glad to go to the grocery for you. Why did I want to go to the grocery? Because there it was, the weekly world news sitting at the checkout. Here we have uh, something typical of the weekly world news. ETs will land any day now. By the way, also Charles Manson is going to try to escape from prison in a hot air balloon. Uh, the Weekly World News is an interesting rag. It was actually created um, in 1979 because the National Enquirer, perhaps you've heard of that, another very weird uh, newspaper, was gonna go to color and they had this absolutely wonderful black and white 
monochromal printing press that was doing nothing. So they decided to branch off the weekly world news. Um, and you got and begin to get stuff from the weekly world news that is just outrageously hilarious. Mars Rock, Mars Rocket takes photo of heaven, which is, you know, okay, it's not about Mars, but I just got to, uh, well, it's only about Mars because it was a rocket that was going to Mars, which is actually some pixelated galaxy with some rays coming out of it. And of course, you got the dinosaurs on Mars. And this new photo of life on Mars, which is some electron microscope of some bug or something like that. But also one of those great and wondrous delusions that uh, in, infected the world for a while, the face on Mars, which we will get to. Of course, Noah's, Mark, Noah's Ark was found on Mars, a, a kind of a thing that went on for years with Mars was the Bat Boy, who was found in a cave on Earth, but eventually ended up on Mars. But you see the Bat Boy in practically every uh, edition of the Weekly World News. He has Martian characteristics. And of course, this one, one of my favorites. Here is a picture, my friends, of Ballas Marineris. But what? The interpretation is that Mars is cracking in half, but not to worry, because we can fix it and make Mars stronger. And of course, another thing that we're gonna get to, I hope if I don't run out of time, which I probably already have, is that the starting in 1976, you begin to get the Viking images, both from orbit and on the surface. And of course, here we have a Christmas tree on Mars. I mean, isn't that obvious? And then later on, to show you that this never went away, Obama appoints a Martian ambassador and here I have to, to say, and I'm gonna tell you why, is where all of this, the hideousness sometimes of the weekly world news finally made me never look at another screen of it. We start with Hillary Clinton on Mars, and then an alien baby is found on Mars, and then Hillary Clinton adopts an, the alien baby. Now those are out of sequence, I have to confess to you. But what got me, and I think this is kind of representative of the kind of attachment that this feeling that you get that Martians represent the other, either racially or culturally or whatever, and we'll see more of this later on, is that the alien baby is just a slightly retouched image of an, a, a, an African child dying of starvation. I mean, how low can you go? Now, of course, uh, one, of the, one of the great hoaxes uh, was the uh, alien autopsy film released in, on August 28th, 1995. Uh, the fellow who did this, I will not dignify his name by mentioning it, also I can't remember it. Um, claims to have, this is by the way, a museum image at the UFO Museum in Roswell, claims to, uh, claimed at first to have recorded this autopsy of an alien. Note that it, the alien has many of the characteristics we were talking about, the thin body, the big brain, the big eyes, etc. cetera. Uh, turns out uh, he admitted in 2006 that the film was actually a fake because the original film, which he had had in his possession, was destroyed by fire or something like that. And so he had to restage it, but he swore 
it was absolutely a correct reenactment of actually what actually happened. If you've seen this film, I won't show it to you. It's pretty disgusting as they pull chicken parts out of this um, very obviously fake model of an alien. So what we're beginning to develop, I want you to see are your two basic variations of the Martian. One, is the bug-eyed monster or BEM, bug-eyed monster with big brains. And the other we shall see is the little green, little green man. The bug, this is a scene from, I think it's the first uh, unaired, finally aired episode of the pilot of Star Trek. Um, the, one of the great purveyors of this really um, almost horrific view of these uh, bug-eyed monsters with big brains who really do represent the other, the, the foreigner who wants to do us harm is uh, Educational Comics, also known as EC Comics. Um, and that just, EC educational comics is kind of a misnomer, but they did a really great horror, um, really great science fiction to the point where they got in trouble with the comics code authority and, uh, and eventually after a long time, they were forced out of business, but they also begat mad magazine, by the way. Um, they, they lasted though through the mid 40, uh, from the mid 40s through the 1950s. And they kind of exemplify uh, what the, the kind of typical big eyed, bug eyed monster with a big brain looked like. And I have to tell you folks, they had uh, from the old one, they had the barrel chest and the big eyes and the big heads. Uh, they were often tall and thin, but far more muscular. Um, and they uh, sometimes has, as you see here, in these, these cases, mechanical tentacles. But the uh, kind of the worst representation of the bug-eyed monster, and I might add the most reflective of this kind of prejudice that was developing of the other, especially the communist other, was in 1961, uh, Topps Bubblegum Cards produced a series called Mars Attacks. And I could show you some reprehensible ones of these, of Martians with their ray guns blowing off the skin of human beings. But the one that caused them to have to wreak, because of a public clamor, to have to recall these series of bubblegum cars. Right here, you see that poor boy, it's Billy again. Um, screaming in horror as an alien vaporizes his dog. You would think that the flesh melting off of the human beings would be bad, but this is worse because we all know that a boy and his dog is the most important thing in the universe today. Well, of course, as, as we were talking about this movie a little bit earlier, uh, it, it's important because it begat kind of the, uh, uh, this m movie by Tim Burton called Mars Attacks, which don't tell me now, I think came out in 1999 or something like that, and represents all of the characteristics of the bug-eyed monster and this one really does have bug eyes with the big brain. You can even see the brain. I have one of those heads right here. 
anybody wants to wear one for Halloween. Now, uh, this, uh, by the way, if you want to see where that came from, um, this is the, a copy of the Topps bubblegum card uh, the, from which the, uh, from which uh, Tim Burton got his uh, inspiration. But I want you to notice, and here we go again, this is something that's come up before. When you see representation of aliens, they are often holding scantily clad women from the science fiction magazine, pulp, planetary stories from a weird movie I cannot remember the name of, but there we are with the bug-eyed monster with the big brain and the woman showing a lot of leg. Why? Why, you ask yourself, do we see these bug-eyed monsters with big brains often accosting or carrying a scantily clad woman? Why, my friends? Because they want our woman, women. This is a theme that you see in the pulp science fiction especially the bad pulp science fiction in the movies. There's even a movie named Mars Wants Women or something like that. It's just really, really awful stuff. The second basic characteristic, the kind of alien, is the little green man. He's a little different. He has many of the characteristics of the original alien, but this time he's green. And a lot of people, and he often has tentacles. That goes all the way back to the original H.G. Uh, Wells story. But he's not dangerous. He's kind of funny, kind of fun. He's kind of a trickster. And uh, where uh, you... Uh, you know, you've got all the characteristics, physical characteristics of the original alien, except for the green. And I did quite a bit of research on this, my friends, and I have come to the conclusion that two of the theories about this, here he is, recognize him from Toy Story, I think. And then of course, there's Marvin the Martian, who I know he isn't green, but he's always dressed in green, and his dog, K9 is always green. Here he is attempting to destroy Earth because it's obscuring his view of Venus. But uh, there's an old folk tale about two green children who appeared in the, what was it, the 13th century, uh, 1200s. Uh, outside of a little village called Woolpit, and they were green. And they couldn't, they were too young or uh, too confused to describe where they were from. And throughout the alien, uh, the kind of the UFO community, um, people sus suspect that they were aliens, but the green, their greenness may actually come from that. But I have a different theory. And it has to do with the foreignness, the alienness. Um, you're looking at a person dressed in dream, but he's kind of a trickster. And he's always trying to get something out of you by fooling you, by making false promises. He goes all the way back in some ways to the Martian god of war. And uh, he represents a kind of ambivalent attitude that people had uh, uh, about the Irish at the time, and there's the sense that they are uh, foreign and that they're kind of tricksters. And, um, and they represent another one of these elements, rather represent, uh, reprehensible, uh, that uh, kind of filter through all of these representations of aliens. Now, I wanna go back to 1953. Because um, remember, those two movies, War of the Worlds, Invaders from Mars, had a big influence on um, the 
kind of on the world of the day. And what they did was, was spawn a bunch of hoaxes. At the time, there were a lot of UFO sightings as well, and uh, they helped to uh, promulgate this. Uh, the first of these, uh, to make a long story short, you got a little town, you got a family running into, and the entire family running into the local uh, uh, police office and saying they had seen these aliens, they were scuttling along the ground. Note they have uh, many of the characteristics of the classic alien, including the long tentacle-like arms. What they do have are big ears. This was um, around the time that invaders from Mars uh, hit the screens. They actually claim to have seen them scuttle into the spacecraft and take off. And then um, uh, in the years that follow, you begin to see the same basic alien uh, drawn in a similar way in various um, small towns. Madisonville, Kentucky, Evansville, Indiana, Clarksville, Texas. It was kind of um, a pandemic of weird Martian drawings, but they all looked very much alike. This, of course, is evidence that they really exist or that, you know, people are reading other people's newspapers. But the one, I hesitate to even tell you about this because it is so ugly and funny at the same time, if you have that kind of sense of humor, there is the story of the monkey man. The date, July 8th, 1953. A policeman is driving along a dark country road, Route 78, uh, outside of Atlanta, Georgia. No other cars on the road, except there's a car stopped in the middle of the road. It's lights shining on the road. And there are three guys led by a fellow named Ed Waters. He was barber and claims to be 28. Looking down at an alien creature from Mars. Small thing, monkey-like. And as the policeman shines his flashlight in the area around, he finds burn markings all around the grass in the area. They claim that they had come around the curve, they have been honky tonkin, which means going out and getting drunk. And uh, they had come around the curve and they had run over one of the aliens. The rest had run into their saucer-shaped spacecraft. I note with interest that there had been some uh, sightings of saucer-like objects just a couple of nights before uh, in near the town they, uh, they lived in. And So the policeman told them to take their car off to the side of the road, took them down to the local constabulary where they call in the town coroner and he looked at it and said, I've never seen anything like this. Um, it didn't take, there they are holding the poor thing. Well, it made all the newspapers, folks. And it, of course, was a hoax and a hoax of a particularly reprehensible time. Ed, who looks like he's about 17 in this picture, had bet his buddies in a drunken stupor 10 bucks that he could get his name in the newspaper. And having read about these saucer shaped or these saucer uh, apparitions, he went out and bought himself a monkey for 25 bucks. And he cut off its, he, first he killed it by chloroforming it to death. Then he removed all of its hair using one of those chemical debilitories that I don't think are on the market anymore. I think one of them was called Nair or something like that. And, um, 
put this thing by the side of the road with his buddies, parked their car so that the lights would shine it, and then took a blowtorch and uh, burned off a lot of the grass by the side of the road. Because it was a small town, because the guy was humiliated already, he was not charged with animal cruelty, I would have thrown him into jail and throw away the keys. Or purveying this hoax, he actually got a $40 fine for blocking the roadway. But as recompense, the originally this, uh, poor monkey was called the Mars Man. The name was transferred to Ed Waters. He became the Mars Man. Humiliated, he left the town soon thereafter. The Mars Man is still on display at a local museum. And of course, oh, I've already run way long. There's of course the face on Mars. Richard Hoagland's thing. Hey, it's the Weekly World News again. Which, you know, turns out to be uh, basically a pile of sand that uh, was judiciously arranged into a face from the right angle. If you took the image from the Viking spacecraft in 1976, by 2001, the face had disappeared so much for the face on Mars, but by God, it does look like a face. By the way, I don't know, by 2006, it still looks like a face, except I think it looks like a face like a lion. As um, Bob Newsom once said to me, he's a uh, retired professor at Ohio State in the astronomy department at Ohio State University, said, you know, Tom, if you pile it up, up uh, rubble in enough different ways, it's a, one of them is eventually going to look like something. And even scientists are fooled. They were fooled by the Mars rock, originally collected in 1984, by something like 1994 or 95, they were looking at this, they having figured out that it was a Martian meteorite, they were looking at it with an electron microscope, and they came up with these. And of course, NASA did a big press release, they held on to this for a year trying to verify it, but they made a big to-do about it. I mean, uh, Bill Clinton had, uh, had a press conference and he said, well, you can see, I can't see it because I, uh, wait a minute, maybe if I do this, oh, there we go. Um, if this discovery is confirmed, it will surely be one of the most stunning insights into our universe that science has ever uncovered. Its implications are as far reaching and awe inspiring as can be imagined, even as it promises answers to some of the oldest questions, it poses still others even more fundamental. And I said, we're gonna keep looking at it. Well, that's a good thing because Oops, now why am I not? Huh. Wait a minute. For some reason, oh, here we go, I have to use this. Okay. Now the results of it, however, of course, and hey, we're back to the weekly world news again. Um, the Mars rock virus invades, infects the United States. Of course, all of this was completely bogus, um, or it seems to be, there's still some argument about it, but careful examination of the rock by geologists suggests that these structures could have been produced on Earth. These magnet, magnetites could have been produced on Earth by regular geological uh, forces. 
Now, finally, I'm almost done, folks, because I'm going to go through this one real fast. Yeah, get the images from the spacecraft. As I was saying before the talk, um, I want to see pictures again here. OK, um, as I was saying before the talk, uh, you've got these UFO um, aficionados looking at these images. When a, when a batch of them is released by NASA, they look at them with a magnifying glass, trying to find cool stuff in them that indicate life on the planet. And these, now it won't let me change slides. These come in various categories. The first category I call animal, vegetable, or mineral. Here we have some fossilized worms. Here we have some dragon scales, uh, dragon scales. Here we have some giant slugs, or if they're not slugs, they are giant statues of slugs. Here we have a fossil of a fish. Here we have the whole fish. Here we have, now this one's kind of hard to see, but you gotta look right, look right there, do you see it? Is down here, is some sort of fossilized crab-like creature. There he is, see him a little better. A human femur thigh bone, fossilized of course. Second category, are they messages? Are they art? Are they artifacts? Are they breakfast? You have these weird, weird swirly things, which turns out to be lava flows, but you know, they look so awfully artificial, don't they? Signs perhaps that the Martians are trying to communicate with us. And here we have, I swear to God, what, some people said was Morse code. Now I'm only showing you a small part of a larger image, but really that you, you, dots and dashes, right? Um, one of the uh, NASA scientists decoded these dots and dashes because if the Martians are trying to reach us in Morse code, surely they know Morse code and this would translate into well, you know, you get the idea. In other words, it makes no sense at all. And here we have, my gosh, it's factory smoke coming from a smokestack. No, it isn't. It's an avalanche of some sort. And here we have a cannonball. Ness, you know what this is, right? It's a blueberry. Well, it's actually just a few, a few uh, millimeters wide, and they're some hematites or something like that. There's a close-up of the blueberries. Uh, this one actually was identified, uh, you know, as, as some sort of like. Um, a signs of militarism. These are like shot from a shotgun or something like that, which is closer than a cannonball, at least in size anyway. And then this one I love because one of the uh, landers managed to capture this light on the horizon, a Martian light in the horizon which turns out to be most likely the fact that the camera was lucky enough to image a cosmic ray, cosmic ray hitting the, uh, the lens or the detector of the camera. And of a spoon, a really, really long spoon. Do you see it here in the middle? And now here's a weird one. Ooh, ee, ooh. Can you say it with me? Ooh, ee, ooh. You take a picture one day, and the next day, someone has dropped a jelly donut. Ooh, ee, ooh. And then, of course, there's the category of shiny things. Most of these are very small. And notably, they are very near the spacecraft, beginning to get the picture here. <laughs> this one is not a, 
little fleck of the spacecraft that's fallen off. This is probably an iron meteorite sticking out of the sand. I mean, I, when they found the Martian meteor, you know, it's it's fun to go to Antarctica here to look for meteorites because you're walking along and there's nothing but ice. And then all of a sudden there's a rock sitting there. I, gee, I wonder where that came from. Well, the same thing is true of this iron meteorite, but it does look manufactured, doesn't it? And then finally, there's the category of Mars needs women, two statues of women. Here's one, if you, if you can't see her, here she is. Actually, she's called, she's been called the ghost of a woman on Mars as well. Ooh, -ee -ooh. And there's ne another statue of a woman. And finally, and I'll end with these, the faces. But are they human? <laughs> Here we have two of them. Um, I, I love this one because, well, I guess their faces. I don't know. I guess they have eyes, nose, mouths, mouths, and chins. But I love the one on the left because it has a pompadour. In other words, it's a very cool face. Here's the famous kissy face on Mars. Wow, that one's incredible, don't you think? And then there's the Assyrian God. They don't know which Assyrian God this is. On the left, you see the image from Mars. On the right, you see the Assyrian God unnamed from the British Museum. Uncanny, isn't it? And then there's the uh, Sasquatch skull. And this one, which is very tiny, it's an iron meteorite, which looks like a vaguely human from the side with a tiny little kind of tentacle-like arm pushed up against his chin or her chin or its chin. And then there's Pac-Man. Of course, that's just a shadow. And Beaker from The Muppet Show. Hey, you recognize Beaker? And Donald Trump, President of the United States. Now I have superimposed the image on the right, just, just, to, make, just to make the point clear. But it really does look like a profile. And then there is the title of this talk, Elvis on Mars. This is Elvis in full. Vegas regalia. Thank you very much. And of course, from the weekly world news again. Yes, the Mars rover found a fortune cookie. And I'm probably going to, I practice this. Paradiolia. Paradio, paradia, paradelia. And anyway, it's this human characteristic. We don't like randomness. We don't like noise. So when we look at rubble, when we look at randomness or some ambiguous pattern, we tend to see shapes in it. And we are especially fond of seeing human faces. And uh, if you if you don't believe that that's what's happening here, there is the famous Rorschach test. I mean, these are ink plots, my friends. What does that look like to you? It's two aliens looking at each other, obviously. Well, okay, maybe it isn't. Two women playing the drums with a butterfly between them, and the drum has a vaguely alien form wearing black sunglasses. Of course it doesn't. It's just an ink blot. Now that one really does look like an alien, complete with the big ears. Batman. And of course this one, some people say they can see a human face in here. I, I just, I, 
try as I might, I just can't see it. By the way, this is Herr Dr. Rorschach, the inventor of the test, in case you were wondering. I'm sorry to run so long. I got to do one more because this is one we all experienced back in 2003. There was the infamous email, uh, which now I happen to personally know the person who wrote this email. And I actually personally heard him make similar comments to this. Um, on national TV, and um, what it did was create one of the greatest pains in the neck and other parts of the body for people like me who were doing, you know, we did 10 programs in 10 days, and it was all because on one of those days, August 27th, 2003, Mars was going to look as big as the full moon in the sky. Here is the actual email. At a modest 75 power magnification, here there is one of those accidental carriage returns. Then Mars will look as large as the full moon to the naked eye. Well, people just went nuts. Wait a minute. People just went nuts with this. I don't know why it keeps doing this to me. Um, here's a slide from a slideshow that I get as an email or a message attachment to this very day. Every year since 2003 in August, I've gotten at least one of these. Um, on August 27th, you'll see two moons in the sky, a little photoshopping here. It won't happen again until 2087. You know why it won't happen again until 2087? Because it didn't happen at all, of course. But um, the horror of it was the just, you know, just dealing with all the phone calls and the emails was one thing, but um, the calls, I mean, we did print 10 programs in 10 days and nine of them were clear. I didn't, I didn't do an all nighter. I did an all weeker for 10, more than that, for 10 days. And um, you would finally get everything arranged and get the 150 people stuffed into that lecture hall at Perkins. And you try to explain to them that there, it's not going to be as big as the full moon. And you know you're going to send them up to the telescope and you're doing the little slideshow ahead of time. And you say, and now I want to approximate for you what Mars is going to look like. So I use a little, you know, like the Stellarium thing and I, and I make it a little bit bigger so you could see the little polar cap and the green markings on it. And I say, now, Hold your fingers like this and hold that up and just look at that little part so that you look like you're looking through a telescope. That is what you are going to see. And I actually had people screaming at me, yelling at me, yelling, cheat and jip and a lot worse. I had one, one night, I had a drunk who just I was afraid it was going to physically abuse me after the talk. So here is my message. When you read the weekly world news, don't believe everything you read. But my message is also this. Uh, we create these images uh, of, of these aliens of and We've been wrong over history more than we have been right. That doesn't mean we're wrong now. But if you see something, I know you will. If somebody tells you about something that seems too good or too weird to be true, it probably is. And uh, also, um, 
look in your hearts. I know I did when I saw that weekly world news of the starving African child. And if you get a kick out of these things, uh, look into your heart and maybe search out as I did, why you did and why, because they reflect some dark thing about yourself that you don't want to believe about yourself. And uh, maybe if you do that, maybe you'll still think it's funny in a weird way, but maybe you'll understand that dark thing inside of you that maybe caused you to think it was funny. And maybe as it did for me that one fine day, um, help me to see, help me, help me to be a better person as a result. And I'm sorry I talked so long. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say about that. Actually, it, it's not true. I skipped over some really good stuff. You'll have to read my book. Any questions? Thank you so much, Tom. That was great. Um, it was really cool to see uh, how like our views of Martians and Mars had changed over time. I've never seen a talk that has put like historically in order like that. So it's kind of fun to follow the, the change in our views. Well, as Elvis on Mars would say, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I have a question. So what, um, if you had your own weird thing about Mars that you wish were true, what's like the weirdest thing on Mars that you really wish was real that you would put in your own magazine if you had one? Uh, uh, I think that there would be a great underground civilization on Mars that had survived despite the harsh conditions, despite all of the difficulties they had to face, including the fact that they had to live in close quarters in underground in Mars, and that they had found a way to triumph over what weirdly, evil and competitive characteristics they had, that they had learned to share resources, that they had survived the moment. And it seems, I'm, I'm gonna guess in every intelligent civilization where you reach the point where you were intelligent enough to destroy yourself, but still animal enough to do it. And I'd want, to look face to face with them and say, tell us what to do. How can we do that? How can we triumph over our animal nature? Give us the benefit of your intelligence. That would be mine. That's my short story. Thank you. Um, if anyone on Zoom has questions, feel free to un unmute and ask. And I'm going to monitor. Anybody left on Zoom? <laughs> people. And I'm going to monitor uh, the Facebook chat. And there's a 30 second lag on Facebook. So, Facebook, feel free to type your questions in the chat and I will um, ask them over here uh, after a short delay. And while we're waiting, I will again give you my rendition of feelings. Feelings, nothing more than feelings. Feelings again in my heart. Feelings, whoa, 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 whoa. What comes after that? Oh yes. Feelings. Come on, ask me something. You expressed an interest in movies made before, was it 1958? That is correct. 
what set that date for you? It was the last great film noir ever made. And I would say, well, okay, I'm not going to say this because I'm not going to say that it's the last great, truly great movie ever made. And that was uh, Orson Welles' Touch of Evil. And uh, that to me was the end of an era of great movie making. And don't get me wrong. I mean, yeah, I love 2001, et cetera. But uh, I just love the movies made before 1958 because of that movie. It was the end of the era of film noir. So Tom, uh, Percival Lowell had a sort of benign look at aliens. I mean, his, his, his aliens were, were sort of, you know, they were troubled, but uh, they were more or less you know, wise and, uh, oh, yes, indeed, and, and, yeah. and that kind of thing. But uh, not two years later, H.G. Uh, Wells flipped that on its head. Uh, and it seems that the H.G. Uh, Wells version is, is what we've inherited. We've inherited this sort of mischievous alien invader, uh, you know, want to take over the earth type aliens. Uh, what, what do you yeah. think accounts for the, for the difference? Well, you know, it, really there are two streams. Okay. And of course, you have the, the you know the Martian invader, the alien invader on in one stream. Ooh, that's weird. What that happens when I do that? Um, but then you have the uh, the stream where they really do come to help us, or they come to study us, and uh, it, it's fun. Um, God, now I can't think of it. My favorite science fiction movie, Platu Barada Nikto. The day the earth stood still. Uh, um, I think the, the evil alien predominates because every time, every time you see one of those major steps, something bad is happening in the world. Um, there, there are tensions in Europe, you know, that, or it, it, often it, it's because we're in a war, we're about to go to war. It is no coincidence that Orson Welles did that broadcast and that it had the effect it did in 1938. Hitler was rising to power in Europe. Uh, he had begun the annexations. Um, people were really scared and they had, the, uh, there, were, there were deep prejudices caused by that fear, that otherness, say, of the German people, which only got worse uh, as the war finally happened and then progressed. So um, at least the, the evil alien really does rise out of that um, hate, kind of hatred um, of, of otherness that kind of prejudice we have of some foreign people, some religious ethnicity. There's really a book in there, or, or, or some religious belief or ethnicity or, or culture or whatever. Um, to me, the big turning point is that in that is the Martian Chronicles, where Bradbury does try to see that more deeply. And, if, and things began to turn away to some degree, at least in a lot of science fiction writing from that, from that evil alien uh, after uh, Bradbury wrote the Martian Chronicles. Then you began to get the ETs. <clears throat> so over on Facebook, Jim Christmas says, love the analysis of how Martians are a projection of otherness and the Martians wanting our women is pretty overt reference to miscegenation. And then on our chat and both Facebook, we have several people that wanna know where they can find your book. <laughs> I've been writing it for 30 years, longer. 
<laughs> but no, you know, um, if there's a book in any of the, I've, you know, like people are saying, why don't you just string your columns together or something like that? But I think this is style would make a really interesting book. And, and uh, you know, give me another 20 years of life and I might get it done. I am a slow writer. <laughs> So you don't need to be a fast writer. You need to record what you're saying and hand it off to somebody who transcribes it. Ooh. There's no excuse. Ick. Ick. <laughs> one, one th you know, if you, if I'm I'm a rhetorician by trade, by the way. That's I, I teach writing, and one thing you notice is that there has never been a, a well structured speech delivered impromptu. Uh, just, I'm, I mean, I might uh, say it and then transcribe it, but then I'd spend the next 15 years rewriting it to get the sentence structure right. I don't, when I send my column in, Brad, when I give them to you, I don't send them because they're good. I send them because they're due and I've run out of time. I would, I would work them to death. I would work them to death. I just, I don't know, that's, sort of, that's why I'll probably never write a book. I produced, you know, on average about 700, between 750 and 1500 words of text every week of my life since 1988. No breaks for Christmas. <laughs> but if, if I were ever to do anything with that, I'd rewrite the whole thing. But thank you for asking. Feelings. <laughs> Unless somebody asks a question, I'm gonna keep singing. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Feelings. <laughs> All right then. Thank you very much.